Joining us right now from Pathios is uh, Dennis Knapp. He writes over there at Pathios.com. And recently, there's been a lot of concern from a lot of, I would say, a tremendous amount of Catholics who aren't feeling listened to especially during all of these listening sessions with the Synod on Synodality. And not to mention the people they are listening to seem to be people who really hate church teaching. And uh, there's a, a lot of concern here. Dennis Snap joins us now. Good morning to you, Dennis. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, praise be to God. We're, we're grateful okay. for your time today. You have an article out there uh, this morning, uh, several articles, actually. One is uh, entitled, The Church Has Failed. Let us know what you're thinking here. Well, um, as everybody knows, we get these, uh, when we're mass, we get these announcements. Well, we did get the announcements before about these listening sessions. And I was under the impression when I was at mass that these listening sessions were about, hey, this, how can the church better serve you? Uh, it wasn't anything about doctrine. It wasn't anything about dogma. Nothing was going to be changing in terms of um, what the church is going to teach. Uh, but it's just like, hey, this is how we're going to better serve you. And then if you look at what Pope Francis wrote in his encyclical uh, about the, uh, the synod of synodality, it was basically about, hey, how can I better serve you? But if you look at the document that was produced by the U.S. Uh, listening sessions, it's called the Synthesis. It's a long, it's a long title. I'm not going to go into that, how, how long it is. But when you read that document, it basically reads like a, uh, a list of things that want, they want to change, including how we address human sexuality, how we address uh, uh, people who are uh, remarried uh, within, the, within the church but don't get annulment, how we address uh, the LGBTQ community, um, basically de-emphasizing church doctrine and dogma uh, and moral teachings in light of how to be more of a welcoming church. And so I looked at this, and I was like, this is not how I— look at the church. And I, I was wondering if I'm kind of alone. And so <laughs> my recent one about how the church failed was, if you also read it, that doc, read that document, it's like, do Catholics even understand how doctrine and dogma develops over time and how the doctrine and, and, and dogma can develop and change within the Catholic church and understand that the Catholic church doesn't change doctrine or dogma. It, it develops it uh, as, as St. Uh, Cardinal Henry, Henry Newman explained in his uh, essay on doctrinal development, it develops over time. It can't contradict what comes before. It must be in line with the deposit of faith handed down by the apostles. And therefore, if we try to change it and it doesn't align with what's in the past, it's actually a, an innovation and a corruption. And so everything I read in this document about yeah. uh, the changes are basically what Newman would call a corruption. Mm. But it, it, the, the document, my, my concern with the document is, and all the documents that are going to be, or all the syntheses that are going to be accumulated around the world, this is just from the U.S. This was just presented to the USCCB. And it makes it sound like all the faithful in the U.S. want these changes. Right. Yes. I was, that's, my, that's my problem. I was going to uh, bring that up because uh, we've heard reports of Many Catholics around the country who have gone to listening sessions with the intent of expressing a desire for fidelity to Holy Mother Church and her timeless teaching. Uh, she is the same yesterday, today, and forever because she is united to her Savior, Jesus Christ. And yet there seems to have been many reports that uh, the, the uh, conclusions were already written before the listening sessions were even held. And not everywhere, but of course, in many places, it seems like that is the case. Are you also seeing that? I was not aware of that. But also, if you look down in who were part of the listening set or like who are part of the organization of listening sessions, and you look at the like the credentials of the people that were that were called upon. And I'm, I'm not against like social justice and peace and, and that sort of thing, but if you look at all the people that were in dif different regions, it was all, hey, who's the leading this listening session? It's the director of peace and, and what, you know, uh, basically a social justice uh, leader within that region was yeah. the one that was in charge of that listening session. And so w when I was looking at the document, I also came, I, I came across some things I, I wanted to point out too. I, I didn't point this out in my, doc my articles, but the word marginalized appears five times. In, in, the, in the document, the word polarization appears five times. 
the word welcoming appear, appears eight times and the word justice appears 15, 13 times. And anybody familiar with the, with the history of like social movements in the United States, mm-hmm. marginalized means a certain thing to certain people. And it's basically comes out of the social movements of the seventies, which talks about power. Like people who are marginalized don't have power. And those who marginalize them do have power. And so the church is basically, I feel like, baptizing in a way that kind of social justice, well, in, in, in a very certain way of looking at social justice to buy into that fact that the church is this powerful institution that looks at other people that don't fall in line with, are not faithful or, like you said, fidelity to Holy Mother Church, and they exclude them. Yeah. Because she has standards, and all Christians, all Catholics, are required to live up to those standards. You, me, Rudy, Adrian, all of us are expected or are called to holiness by the, by God. Not not necessarily. I mean, church calls us to holiness, but they call it it calls us to holiness because of God's God calls us to holiness. Yeah, and it, you know we, yeah. we're supposed to encounter uh, people, the lost, the marginalized, as, as you mentioned. I mean, yes, we're supposed to do this, but. Ultimately, meeting people where they're at does not equate to letting them stay there. We're, we meet people where they're at in the complexity and the, the dirtiness of a sinful nature, but we're supposed to get them to heaven. Like, that's the goal. That's the mission of the church. And yet, it would seem, it would seem that there are many within the church hierarchy that, that are no longer willing to take them to where they're supposed to go, but rather let them stay there. Are you seeing that as well? Yeah. The, the, I, I, in my recent article about the church has failed us, I, I point out an example from Ireland that's kind of going around right now, kind of viral, where a retired priest uh, visits a church and he gives a homily about sin yeah. and about holiness and about how we need to be faithful to, to what God is calling us to because we are all trying to get to the same place. Mm. We're all trying to go to heaven. And he was uh, corrected by his bishop saying that that's not how the, that's not a Christian message. What what I think the bishop was trying to say just to be more charitable to the bishop was, Hey, the way he presented it was not very uh, pastoral, if you will. And so he just laid out Catholic doctrine and dog, you know, he laid out the doctrine of sin forgiveness and repentance. Uh, and, and he, and it was everything he said was totally in line with what the church teaches. There's nothing he said that was not. The problem is, is that the Bishop, when, when priests do that and they're not backed up by their Bishop, it gives the faithful or, or it, it sows confusion. And in the last appeal I do in my, uh, my article, the church has failed us is I address bishops directly. And I call them the shepherds of our souls because that's their primary responsibility. Their primary responsibility is helping me get into heaven. If they don't do that, then God's going to hold them more accountable because that's their main job. Yes. Um, yeah, that's, exactly. So I'm appealing to them. I'm saying, listen, if, if, if you don't want to help me get to heaven because uh, it's my soul, maybe, maybe you may look at your own and think about your own Hold that thought, Dennis Knapp. Here's a a quote Dennis uh, quoted from Cardinal Mueller. It says, quote, They, the farmers of the, uh, the framers rather, they, the framers of the U.S. document, are dreaming of another church that has nothing to do with the Catholic faith, and they want to abuse this process for shifting the Catholic church, and not only in another direction, but in the destruction of the Catholic church. Nobody can make an absolute shift and substitute the revealed doctrine of the church, but they have these strange ideas as doctrine, as only a theory of some theologians, close quote, Cardinal Mueller. Uh, Dennis, welcome back to the program. Some are speaking out, and uh, yet we still see some like Cardinal Holarek over in Europe, as well as others, Casper and many others, fully embracing—I I still don't understand why they stay Catholic. I mean, 
there are other options. You could just go and become an Anglican, Episcopalian, any other brand of Christianity, and you almost, they almost all embrace all of this shenanigans. But these people feel the need to uh, to do this stuff from within. Do they not? Yeah. And it's funny, I wrote an article about, allow me to introduce you to the Episcopal Church. That's yeah. kind of a tongue-in-cheek. Like, you know, hey, if you want these things, they're they're out there for you. Uh, you don't have to necessarily stay in the church and change her from the inside because honestly, change is impossible. Uh, that's why I want to, and I also use uh, Pope Francis's words from that encyclical stating that this is not for doctrinal change. Another thing, when you look at the, syn- the synodal path in Germany, my big concern too is they're going to try to use a Catholic understanding called the census fidelium, mm-hmm. which if, and this is the biggest concern I have, if enough Catholics from around the world produce these synthesis calling for change, then the, according to the census fidelium, according to some people's look at the census fidelium, then the faithful all around the world, all these, uh, all these local listening sessions, all these synthesis are calling for change. So Pope Francis must listen to us if that's the way they look at that. That's the way he's understanding census fidelium. You know, it's so, interesting that yeah. you bring that up because that's a major problem with uh, the Synod, right? Is because they're saying we want everyone to participate, even non-Catholics, apostates, heretics, uh, people who have left the faith, people who have only gone to church once a year. But by the very term, the census fidelium, the sense of the faithful implies that you're, it's part of those who are faithful. Now, I mean, not saying that you have to be perfect, but you have to be a practicing Catholic, meaning you're trying to be a good Catholic. And the other thing is, I for, I'm forgetting the citation, I, I'm trying to remember, but there was uh, one of the popes who said that the teachings of the church can never be understood in a way that it was not originally intended. It cannot be understood in an altogether different way. And these two principles would seem to forbid any of these changes that we're seeing. Uh, what do you think about those two things? Yeah, I would think that if you look at the census fidelium in terms of the catechism of the Catholic Church, it's very clear. It lays it out. It says the census fidelium only only is in, in, employed when the bishops, priests, deacons, the magisterium of the church, and the faithful come together, and and they basically affirm which what was handed down through the Holy Spirit. The magisterium of the church needs to direct or guide the faithful because they have the the special gift by the Holy Spirit of infallibility. Uh, it, so there, there's th- this, the faithful cannot be infallible. And like I said, even Pope Francis in his encyclical said, we cannot, the faithful cannot be, be manipulated or, or, or go towards the, the logic of the world or p- current public opinion. It cannot be influenced by that. But when you read the synthesis, that's what it seems to be. The synthesis seems to be what does the church want to change now? And it reflects everything that we see that those who are dissenting from the church want to change. Now, Dennis, uh, let me let me just play devil's advocate here. Uh, I I've kind of lived in 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 a corporate environment for a long time. Uh, when I left it, uh, one of the, the the really popular things to do was to produce these listening sessions and say, look. We want to hear your opinions on certain things. And it was just a way for people to vent. In reality, they already made their decision. Do you think that uh, they're just the, that the, the Vatican and all of these different synods have already come to a conclusion and they're just kind of letting people kind of vent about these, these modern innovations that they want to bring into the church and maybe aren't actually going to do that? I, I hope not. So in all my articles I write, I'm, I'm giving the church the de- benefit of the doubt. I'm hoping that the Holy Spirit will, <clears throat> excuse me, will guide her, and and then that Pope Francis and the and the cardinals and the magisterium will correct uh, the these these uh, variant these variant thoughts from from traditional uh, Catholic teaching. Um, that's my hope. Um, I when I look at the the synod as synodality in terms of what it was meant to do, when I, like I said, when I read that encyclical, it's basically, hey, how can we better serve you? 
but it's not serving the souls of the people of God to authorize or not, or, or de- it's more of a de-emphasis, I would say, mm. a de-emphasis on certain things to make the church more welcoming. So we will teach that uh, certain sins uh, are mortal, mm. but we will not. We won't bring them up. We won't bring them up. Yeah. They'll be in our catechism on the yeah. shelf. Yeah. But you're not going <laughs> to, you're yeah. not going to hear yeah, about right. it here. Uh, you know, uh, so it's basically, um, it's like, we're not getting what we need to be, to, to get to heaven, but, right. but we're also going to be welcoming. So it, it, I look at it as like a cancer, like if someone is uh, tragically diagnosed with stage four cancer, a doctor will look, be looked upon as very unempathetic or unsympathetic towards that cancer patient because they maybe don't have cancer, but the doctor needs to tell them, listen, you need to go through this aggressive treatment or you're going to die. So here's let's, let's do it. And the chemotherapy is going to be aggressive. That's like the state of our soul is that we need our bishops to tell us, listen, you're at stage four. We need, we need to get this treatment going or you're going to spiritually die. Mm. And, 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 and sometimes you know, we need to, we need the, the care and compassion of a, of a bishop to do that. But if I don't get treatment for cancer, I have no hope. It's the same thing spiritually. Well, so. I, that's the way I look at it. You know, and it has dangerous uh, implications on the world at large uh, when when the church, when prelates, members of the church, I don't want to accuse the church of doing something. I want to accuse the individuals within the church who are making some of these decisions, when they decide to play fast and loose with morality, theology, liturgy, and the rest, it has implications on the rest of, of the world. How many Catholics who are, like, let's say, politicians today uh, have decided to also play fast and loose with morality? Uh, we see a lot more uh, Catholic politicians who are pro-life, praise be to God, they ought to be. But are they defending marriage? No, most of them not. Uh, they're not defending traditional marriage between a man and a woman, which is the fabric of community. And and so it's having dangerous consequences in the world around them. And I've always said, and uh, there's not a political solution to the problems in the world. We can't just vote goodness into the world. It has to come from Holy Mother Church. She has to, and her members have to decide to convert all souls for the salvation of souls and for the glory of God. And when that happens, good things happen in the world. And so far, it seems like we're seeing a trend in the other direction. So it's not good. Now, you started a petition because you wanted to raise awareness about all of this. Tell us about the petition. Tell us why people should sign it. Well, I started a couple things. I started a Facebook page called Voices of the Faithful in the Senate of Senatality to say, to, to offer updates on, on the things that are happening throughout the world. Like if I find an article saying what's happening in the United States or what's happening in Europe, what's happening in Australia, I'm going to post it so people are aware what's happening. So we're all in, on one page. I also started a petition on change.org uh, called I Support Catholic Teaching in the Synod of Synodality uh, to where we, we need as Catholics to let the, let the Vatican know that we are not part of that synthesis. We're not, we're not, we, we don't agree with it. We want to be faithful to the church, but we need to have something to counteract the synthesis from the, from the lay people and the faithful to say, listen, this is what we believe. Please understand that this does not reflect all of us and that we, we, we do want things to stay. And also we want you as the shepherds of our souls to help us get into heaven. So I started these two things to sort of say, Hey, we need to be on the offensive in terms of like how to let the Vatican know that they have our support too. I want the bishops also to know that we support them, that we support them being bold. We support them to help us, like I said, get to heaven. Mm. And they, I think they need that encouragement because they don't feel like they have the encouragement they need. Like the, all this all mostly started because of the crisis that we experienced in the church uh, of, the, of the, the abuse crisis. And as Rahm Emanuel said back in the day, you know, you never let a good crisis go wasted, basically. And I feel like those in the church who want to change her have looked upon this crisis, which is horrible, mm-hmm. as an opportunity for change. And so I want to let the Vatican know that you know, there are people out here that, that are faithful, and we want, we want them to, to kind of—we uh, want them not to kind of—we want them to focus on what the church teaches and help us, like I said, get to heaven. 
Now, I just signed the petition over at change.org, oh, nice. and I encourage uh, everyone to, uh, to consider signing this petition because the idea here is we want to make our voice heard. And that is a somewhat difficult task, especially given the current climate within uh, certain prelates of the church. But nonetheless, we should put our name on this list to say we want to be faithful to Holy Mother Church, to her timeless teaching, to convert all souls, to defend holy marriage, to defend the right to life. I mean, there's so much that the church must defend and support. And uh, we're seeing... Uh, 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 I want to say slothfulness in, in communicating this to the world. So what an opportunity for the rest of us. I post a link to this change.org, but is there like a short link? Do you have a short link, Dennis? Uh, I do not have a short link. I, I could provide one to you uh, if, I, if I go back to the, to the document. Uh, so it, if they go to change.org, then uh, the rest of the link is 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 kind of complicated. That's why I don't want to I don't want to try to give it over the air because it would just be complicated. But I tell you yeah. what, go to our live video feed today. I'm posting the link there so you can see them on all the live video links, and I'll try to include it in our email this Friday as well. Dennis, God bless you, my brother from Pathios. We really appreciate you being on today. Pathios.com, check them out. God bless you, Dennis. Have a great day. All right, thank you. All right, that's going to do it for hour number one of Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to tune in next hour. Tito Edwards from BigPulpit.com is going to be on. All that and more is coming up, plus the game show. God bless you. God love you. And we'll see you at grnonline.com forward slash CDT.